would you be able to read us uh, anything in the French? Is that something that you could do? Just like just to get a sense of what it sounds like in French? Sure. Why don't I just read the beginning of the second ode, which I feel like is um, as good a place as any to uh, get a sense for the rhythm and the sound of it. Sure. Um, sure. Uh, the second ode, deuxième ode, is called L'Esprit et l'eau in French, the spirit and the water. Um, he he begins all of them except the first with this long argument, as he calls it, an old-fashioned um, term in English and French for just a sort of summary of the contents. I won't skip, I'll skip over that. So in English, he starts the second ode, after the long smoking silence, after the great civil silence of many days, reeking with rumors and smoke, breath of plowed earth and bird song in the large golden cities, suddenly the spirit anew, breath anew, suddenly the secret blow to the heart, the given word, sudden breath of the spirit, sharp rapture, possession, like when in the sky full of night before the first flash of lightning, at once the breath of Zeus descends, a whirlwind full of dust and straw and the dirty laundry of the whole town. My God, who in the beginning separated the waters above from the waters below, and who now have separated the arid zones from the earthly waters I speak of, like a child weaned from the fertile body of its mother, this hot, tenderly leafing earth, nourished only by the milk of the rain, and he goes on. Um, that's only the beginning there of an extremely long sentence, which I won't even attempt to keep doing here. Um, so we'll get to that, that aspect of the style later, maybe. But in French, he says, Après le long silence fumant, après le grand silence civil de majeur, tu fumant de rumeur et de fumée. Alain de la terre en culture et ramage des grandes villes dorées. Soudain l'esprit de nouveau, soudain le souffle de nouveau, soudain le coup sourd de corps, soudain le mot donné, soudain le souffle de l'esprit, le rat sec, soudain la possession de l'esprit, comme quand dans le ciel plein de nuit avant que ne claque le premier feu de foudre. Soudain le vent de Zeus dans un tourbillon plein de paille et de poussière avec le lessive de tout la vi le village. That French was really amazing. I mean, I could I could totally hear the rhythm and uh, the the music of it. Sometimes when I hear poetry in the original language, I don't always. I mean, if it's a language I'm not familiar with, the contours of you know, I don't I don't always immediately hear the music of it. Um, but in that case, I could I could hear it very strongly. It's it's quite remarkable. Yeah, it's um, it's an offering. He presents the second ode there at the beginning of it to God, and um, and so what that makes this part of the odes and and most of the odes is like this is actually technically I suppose prayer and. Um, in any case, it's address. It's a, the, the speaker of the odes is almost always addressing somebody. It's very often God, but it's also uh, other aspects of the sacred or divine. In the first ode, it's muses. In the fourth ode, it is, as the title indicates, the muse who is grace. Uh, the entire thing is basically an act from a drama. It's a dialogue. Uh, the fourth ode, that is. Um, elsewhere, he will address his own soul, um or himself as poet um he's addressing he's always addressing someone this is all apostrophe in a way uh, or address anyhow and um so it's impassioned it, it like i said it's impassioned utterance that's the kind of classic lyric poetry that this is understood to be the tradition in which it participates um and uh, so, therefore, yeah, the rhythm is meant to is meant to to capture that. It's meant to be lively. It's breathing. It's it's an aspiratory rhythm. It's based on how one breathes when one is uh, speaking from the heart. And um, you know, you might understand it by way of contrast with 
a, a very great poem of equal if not greater ambition and accomplishment from a generation later, T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, also, as the title indicates, very musically rooted. And T.S. Eliot was, at that point in his life, in his later life, uh, also a devout man of religion. Um, but, you know, the Four Quartets, as astonishing as they are, are not prayer. Um, they're not Orphic in that way. They're rather erudite, speculative. Um, they are. Uh, they employ various different strophic forms, you know, different styles of stanzas and, and lineation and stuff. Um, they're divided, um, you know, very evenly in these movements. Um, so it, it has a more detached feeling. Um, T.S. Eliot's four quartets do. Whereas the Odes by Claudel are meant to be, um, you could almost say devotional, I suppose. I, I don't always like to talk about them in that way because I don't, I don't think one needs to share Claudel's faith and religious practice in order to benefit and appreciate the poetry. But um, nonetheless, they uh, contain, they exhibit a, a certain... Um, passionate nature, which it is possible for a reader to appropriate for themselves in a way, uh, something in the way that you might be able to glean a certain feeling or disposition from prayers, uh, you know, wrote prayers, prayers that you already know the words to, um, not, not your own, uh, that you make up spontaneously, even though that's what the odes are. Uh, but, you know, Claudel has made them up for us. So, so we can uh, appropriate them. Yeah.